Welcome, everyone, to the 11 o'clock talk. I'd like to uh, introduce Jeff Mann uh, for his talk. I think I won't do justice for his resume, so I'll let him take that off uh, as he introduces his talk here. Does the DOD security work in the real world? So for everyone, Jeff Mann. Thank you. Hey, Hi, everybody. Um, somebody take a picture of me like it's really cool. I'm teaching at Harvard. <laughs> Um, sidebar, some of the dumbest people I ever met, and I hope there's none in the room that I offend, are Harvard Business School graduates. Just saying. <laughs> Is that a good way to start? I don't know. Um, I want to start with a quick survey, you know, show of hands, yell, or whatever. Uh, does DOD security work in the real world? How many people think yes? Wait for the options and vote. Don't just, just No? You're waiting for me to tell you. <laughs> and uh, there we go. <laughs> um, can we do the last two together? <laughs> we could do that. Um, why ask this question, just real quickly, just to frame it, just because uh, what put this question in my head years ago actually happened not too far from here. It was a customer I had uh, eight or nine years ago in the Boston area, shall we say. And uh, I actually have to blame it on PCI. I was there as a QSA. I was doing their PCI compliance assessment. It was a large merchant that is located about 30 miles west of Boston. You do the math. Um, and I was spending an afternoon explaining them what encryption meant, what it meant to protect data at rest, data that's being stored. And we were going through kind of all the different options. And because I'm an ex-cryptographer of NSA, I kind of geek out a little bit when it comes to things crypto. So I was probably giving them a, more detail than they really wanted. So at the end of this long explanation, which I thought was really a, a good thing, I was giving them a lot of detail on what all these things meant. They said, yeah, that's nice, but we don't really need DOD level security. So that's kind of the birth of this talk. Um, you know, I think that what they said was, we sell women's clothing. You know, why, why do we care? But I actually have heard this time and time again over the years of my work, especially in the PCI world. Uh, Midwestern companies, the, you know, the Midwestern mindset is, you know, we're just family here. Everybody gets along. Why would anybody steal things from us? And, and um, the, you know, different mindsets for different companies through the years. So, really, honestly, this 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 statement that this person said eight or nine years ago has stuck with me, um, which can be disturbing at times. If that happens to you, I don't know. Maybe there's treatment. Um, <laughs> Anyway, my name is Jeff Mann. I, uh, you can find me most easily. Uh, I'm often on Security Weekly. I'm one of the co-hosts. I was recently officially uh, uh, endowed as a, a curmudgeon. What do you call it when you get ordained? Whatever. Uh, I used to work at NSA as a pen tester. Another talk, another day. I'm a cryptanalyst, actually a cryptologist. I, I, did, I worked both sides. I broke codes and I actually design codes at, at, cer at certain points. And I'm sort of currently unaffiliated if anybody's hiring. Hire, Hire me. <laughs> um, the, 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 the mask and thing, that was actually a, a job that I did. One of my PCI customers actually produced food. And to get to their office, we had to go through the factory. So I had to don that stuff. So I thought it was cool. Anyway, moving on. Um, I've been in the business. Uh, information security business for going on 34 years now. Um, raise your hand if you're younger than 34, 34 or younger. So imagine your whole life. <laughs> I've been doing InfoSec. So uh, hold that thought. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my, my, my most recent claim to fame. There was a book that came out last year called Dark Territory. Has anybody heard of it, read it by any chance? Um, the fourth chapter is a chapter called Eligible Receiver. Eligible Receiver was the first massive coordinated pen test that NSA performed against its customer, which was primarily the DOD. Happened, I believe, back in 1997, which was a little bit after my time. But in that chapter, there was this paragraph. The NSA had a similar group called the Red Team. It was part of Information Assurance, blah, 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 blah. It was stationed in Phoenix, which they misspelled. Friendship Airport, by the way, is BWI. 
in case anybody's ever been to the Maryland area. Um, during its most sensitive drills, the red team worked out of a chamber called the pit, which was so secret that few people at NSA knew it existed. <laughs> Sounds ominous, right? Um, I actually worked in the pit. I was one of the original members of the pit. The pit was simply our office. <laughs> And uh, this is the Fanex complex, that, which is just uh, west of BWI Airport. That road up in the top is what you drive into to drive into BWI, if you've ever been there. And I'll, I'll little my fancy laser pointer. Pointer. All these buildings, at some point or another, may or may not have been affiliated or are still affiliated with NSA. And the pit was right there in that building, Fanex 3. Um, as I jump into this talk, I do want to dedicate it to uh, one of my oldest friends and one of my mentors, somebody that uh, watched over me more than I even realized as I, I, as I came to learn recently. She passed away, has it been a, has it been a month now, a couple of weeks, is it three weeks? Um, she was one of the people that was responsible for setting up the pit and having the idea that NSA should do pen testing and red teaming. The whole idea of testing the security of our systems, our customer, which was the DOD primarily, uh, classified systems before the bad guys could get to it. it was a novel idea, you know, almost 25 years ago. Um, she had a lot to do with that. We called her mom. She was our den mother and she passed away. So this is dedicated to you, Becky. <sighs> Deep breath moment for Paul. I actually started uh, my career in 1984 uh, and Technically, I didn't start at NSA. My very first job was a summer intern job between my junior and senior year of college uh, at what then was called the Naval Surface Weapons Center, which was also a facility in uh, Maryland, not too far from where I lived. My mom was actually in personnel and HR, so she helped me get a, a job as an intern. Thanks, Mom. Well, well I was technically not allowed, it worked out really in my favor. I wasn't allowed to be an intern uh, because of the nepotism rule, but I was allowed to be hired as a temporary employee. And so at the end of the summer, I didn't like stop working. I went on leave without pay and I came home at Thanksgiving and Christmas, worked here and there. And then I had a job immediately after I graduated. And I worked there for several months until I ended up at NSA. Thanks for asking. Um, <laughs> But my very first job, I, got, I, I was working for a physicist that, that did anti-submarine warfare. That was what he did research on. And he had gotten some money and, and bought this one of these newfangled devices called a desktop PC. I'm pretty sure that's the model I was using. Um, and he hired me because he had this filing cabinet, this locked safe that was filled with, as it turned out, about 25, 30 years of research, reports, white papers, documents, books, anything that he was able to collect on anti-submarine warfare. Um, you know, I was a young, young college student, 20, how old was I in 1984, 22. And when I started with him, he said, well, I need to explain to you what anti-submarine warfare is. And probably the best way to explain it is this book came out recently called The Hunt for Red October. Just read it. It's what we do. So my first week on the job working for the government, I got to read a book. I thought it was really cool. Um, so that was my job. I, I went into this safe. And for the people that raised their hand because they're younger than 34, I found documents in this safe that had been checked out of the technical library of, of, of this research facility before I was born. So I had one of those moments. It wasn't quite as long. It was only 22 years. But I'm like, wow, this document's been sitting in this drawer in this safe for my entire life. So it was kind of weird. But uh, my first experience in security uh, really was that I, I committed a security violation. And uh, I came in one morning, you can read it there, and uh, basically I'd left the safe unlocked. And uh, um, I was like, well, what's the big deal? Uh, I'm, I'm in a building that's surrounded by barbed wire fence. No, not anybody can get into the grounds. Um, to get into the building, you have to go past security and I don't think we had that exact turnstile, but you, know, you get the idea. You had, to, you had to get through somebody. The office that I was in had a lock on the door, and you, know, you had to know the combination to get in. 
And security actually walked the halls at night. They would roam around looking for bad guys and people sneaking in and you know, burglars and whoever, which is how they found that the safe was unlocked because they would go into all the offices and try all the safes. And how I discovered that I had a violation was I opened the safe because they had locked it and there was this pink slip of paper saying, come see us at security. And, and that, was, that was a big deal. So I was young, I was naive, and I thought, what's the big deal? You know, there's all these layers of protection. Who cares if I left the safe unlocked? So remember that. So uh, does DOD security work in the real world? If I'm going to have a conversation, we need to start with maybe defining some terminology, OK? So uh, I think a lot of people, when they hear about DOD level security, they're thinking, well, that's just some you know, nth degree of security. You know, no holds barred on the amount of money, the amount of investment. You can buy all the tools and multiples of every types of tools and technology and, and sort of the sky's the limit. But that's not really what I'm talking about. Um, anybody know what movie that is, by the, by the way? Very good. Um, the, the DOD type of security that I grew up in, especially at NSA, it had many, many disciplines. And I just tried to capture a few because I thought it'd be a cool slide to say, you know, what are the different facets? You know, some of these were there when I was there. And of course, we have to have cool abbreviations for everything in the, in the DOD. So ComSec is communication security. Basically, all the secs are security. Int is intelligence. There's signals intelligence, satellite intelligence, communications intelligence, electronics intelligence so on and so forth. Tempest uh, is emanations. Uh, if you've ever seen pictures of the campus of NSA, there's a couple buildings that are kind of mysterious and black and, and big, huge squares. Um, they're, they're actually built copper clad. The, the entire building is Tempest protected because somebody had the idea, why don't we just build the, the Tempest protection, the, the emanations protection around the whole building and then we don't have to care about what's on the inside, whether the, the monitors bleed and project 100 feet, uh, which they may or may not do then and now. In the early days, they were really bad. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of different disciplines. When I'm thinking DOD level security, I'm thinking about all these different types of things. Um, transmission security. Uh, you may not know what somebody's saying, but if you're a SEAL team and you're deployed in a country and the adversary can figure out where you're broadcasting from, bad things might happen to that area. So there's different facets and there's different elements to DOD security. But uh, in trying to describe DOD level security, uh, one of the things I learned early in, in my InfoSec career was this concept of a risk equation. Now there's many, many risk equations out there. If you Google it, uh, a friend of mine just went through a doctorate program. She probably had to learn a few risk equations. And this is probably bringing back painful memories. But um, I try to reduce things down to the basic elements. And the basic element of the risk equation is there's some sort of fancy function that you can apply. But it has to do with vulnerabilities. What are the, what are the weaknesses, the threats, who are the bad guys that are trying to get you, and what you're doing to prevent or protect yourself against it, what we used to call countermeasures. This all rolls into you know, whatever you're doing or not doing in terms of securing your environment uh, gives you with some sort of value of risk. In the DOD, this value, uh, again, simplifying things, most often has to do with human life. The, the concept of national security, the context, the, the, the context of protecting our troops, protecting national interests, protecting our allies and so forth. Uh, the spies and agents and people we've recruited that are giving us all this super secret information that we have to encrypt, all that kind of stuff boils down to basically, you can think of risk as a quantity of human life. So remember that. Um, as I said, you know, the parameters of risk. Uh, if you ever go to a trade show, or go out and ask some of the, I guess we're upstairs, ask some of the companies that are out there uh, that are talking about risks and threats and vulnerabilities to simply define the term. Uh, you might be surprised at the number of answers you get, the diversity of answers, and, and you might even be surprised at how some of the answers overlap. But if you recall, uh, and my big pet peeve, I get on pet peeves, does anybody else get on pet peeves and rants? But uh, a lot of people talk about threats these days when they're talking about risk, and they sort of equate the two. Risks and threats are the same thing. No, there's a risk equation, threats and an element. Don't you guys get that? 
Anyway, elements of a risk equation. Um, also, too, in terms of InfoSec, uh, you know, this is sort of classic, nothing new. If you've been to school and learned in your history books, this is what it was all about back in the day. It was data security. That's why we locked things in a safe. Um, and the, the, the three concepts are, uh, of protecting data have to do with confidentiality, integrity, availability. We called it CIA because everything has to have an acronym. And it's basically, can you, somebody steal the data? Can somebody alter the data? Can somebody make the data not available? Now, interesting, in, in our internet-connected computer world, there's a few new variations that have been applied to this. We're not talking about that right now. Um, I used to be a cryptographer. I used to design systems. My first assignment was working for the manual crypto systems shop for NSA, so on the InfoSec, the defensive side. So we used to deal with one-time pads. And as far as I'm concerned, it's been downhill from there. Because the one-time pad is unbreakable. If you want secure communications that nobody can break, use a one-time pad. Use it properly. Use it once. That's the, that's the one-time part of it. Um, but it doesn't get any better than that. And so as far as I'm concerned, in the last 25, 30 years, we've taken perfect security and uh, watered it down because we've started to apply machine cryptography, computer-based cryptography, because we want in our information fast and we want it transparently and we don't want to know that there's things going on behind the scenes and we don't have want to have to deal with keys and all that kind of stuff. We just want our data and we want it now, damn it. We need to go back to one-time pads, maybe. <laughs> anyway. So you remember at the very beginning I said, uh, you know, this person that talked to me eight or nine years ago, we don't need DOD level security. It's always haunted me, and especially in the last couple years. Um, and, you know, I've gotten lots of excuses, and, you, you know, you might be thinking of some of these excuses already. Usually when we have the discussion of how DOD level security works or doesn't work, uh, money comes into play. Um, the complexity or the perceived complexity of, you know, we can't afford to do all the different things. We're, you know, we're, we're a different type of shop. Or why should we care? We're just a grocery store. We're just a restaurant. We're just a convenience store, whatever it is. And really those companies in their defense, uh, a lot of companies that are out there, a lot of organizations, until they plugged into the internet, uh, really didn't worry about security and data security. They didn't have to, but, you know, brave new world. You plug into new technology and you sort of have to be a responsible corporate citizen and internet citizen because, you know, by plugging in, you're, you're assuming some sort of risk. And, and not so much anymore, but I've really had customers who are like, wow, well, you know, who would touch us? You know, nothing, nothing bad has ever happened to us. No, we've never had any problems before. Um, this too is actually, this is a sanitized network diagram for a company that was a PCI customer, actually again, a Boston-based company. I didn't intend that. But uh, the red circles up there are supposed to be the card data environment. PCI says, put all your systems together in one environment and protect it and keep it safe from everything else. They don't require it, they recommend it. It's called network segmentation. That's clear as a bell, right? There's no, no crossover, you get the idea. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's not a lot going on here, what, what bad could happen, so what if you're just selling women's underwear? Um, you know, there's big boxes over there, mainframes and all that kind of stuff. These are representative retail locations, they do things a couple ways, so on and so forth. Even that's probably eight or nine years old, I'm sure it's a lot better now. Um, but in the last couple years, as this person what they said and keeps going around and around in my head. I, and especially, it, you don't have to go very long, days, weeks, months. In fact, the, this slide, you, it's hard to keep this slide current. But you know, for all the breaches that continue to be happening and the, and the large companies and the companies we thought that were doing things right or should know better, government, private sector, even security companies, um, even some of the products we use, I, I, got, I got a chance to throw in words. So this is current. I'll have to update it next week, I'm sure. But, you know, all these things happen, and I, as a security professional that's been in the business for 34 years, going on 35, have to do some soul searching and ask myself, we as a community, we as a culture, we as a society, we as an industry, are we really doing anything better? Uh, you know, I, you know. If we, think we've, if, think, if we think we've advanced, if we think the technology's advanced and all this stuff that we're doing is so good, why does this still keep happening? Which is why we have conferences and we get together and talk about it. 
Um, things that I learned, uh, both from the DOD and over the course of my career in the private sector, these are the typically the reasons why uh, networks are insecure, why, you're, why your, your enterprise is insecure. And this is not new information, this is actually a slide that I used probably 20 years ago. Um, trying to teach people if you're going to connect to the internet in the early days, you need to have some semblance of a security program. You need to have policies, you need to have rules, you need to write them down, and you need to follow them. And, um, uh, but, you know, that all gets wrapped up in people don't want to do that, they just want to buy the technology. They don't have the institutional knowledge. They don't, they don't really understand this whole security thing. They don't understand the technology stuff. They're just plugging it in and using it. And you know, money is a big factor. Uh, you know, that's, that's true. Um, so the point of all this is, uh, as I look at the world today and, and, and how things continue to be insecure, and, and if you listen to enough talks, you sort of come away with, wow, everything's just incredibly broken and keeps us employed, most of us, not me. Um, it's weird how that works out. Um, but, you know, I, I wanted to look back at my career and look back on the things that I had learned in the DOD level security, especially the things that I don't see necessarily being implemented in the commercial world, in the real world, and explore a few ideas. I'm not saying this is the answer. I'm not saying I've got the answer. I'm just throwing this out as a conversation starter. So feel free to agree, or feel free to disagree, feel free to dismiss what I'm saying because I'm too old and don't know what's going on, whatever. I just want to throw out some ideas, maybe to just to get us thinking about, is there a different way of doing things? And maybe, we, we don't, maybe the point is we're not, we don't need to come up with something new. Maybe we need to go back and do some of the things that we know we should have been doing all along, but for various reasons we haven't. So the fundamental thing from a DOD perspective on the approach to security is it's really about data. It's, it's, it's about information. Um, my favorite movie, one of my favorite movies. Well, I guess it says it right there. <laughs> I do another talk where I have a lot of movie slides and make people guess what it is. So, yeah, and who are the actors? Everybody remember their name? <laughs> um, but you know, there's a scene in this, and it's toward the end. And and Ben, these guys used to be friends, and they used to hack together in college. Did they go? They were at Harvard or MIT? I forget where they. I think they were. I want to say they were here at Harvard, but maybe not. Maybe it was Caltech or something. But. Um, you know, they're having a conversation towards the end and they're talking about how, in from, you know, we're, the world is at war. I should have it memorized, I don't. And, and, but the war is not being fought with bullets. It's all about the information. So, again, it's all about the information. The approach to security from a DOD per perspective starts with we have a set of information, we need to protect it. That's where it all starts. Um, the risk equation that I've discovered, how it works best in the real world, is you got to start putting dollars and cents on it. Uh, the, the risk uh, factor, whatever that mythical number that you come up with that is involved with whatever algorithm, whatever formula you want to apply, again, I try to be simplistic, really in the commercial world boils down to a, a dollar figure. Remember, the DOD version is human life. In the commercial world, it's a dollar figure. That's a significant difference in terms of the approach to security as a practical matter, and I acknowledge that, and I'm not saying I have a good answer to get beyond that. But, you know, there's vulnerabilities out there, I think we all agree, and, and a lot of this business uh, worries about getting rid of all the vulnerabilities and keeping ahead and plugging all the holes, and some people call it whack-a-mole. Some people will think of the, the, the little Dutch boy trying to plug all the holes in the dike. I sometimes think we should just acknowledge as a community that the vulnerabilities are here. Maybe we should look at some of the other elements of the risk equation. Maybe we can get more traction there. But again, just simplistically, it's all about dollars and cents when you apply it to the commercial world. So what can we learn from DOD level security? One thing that I've noticed is um, we tend to, in the commercial world, we tend to treat everything equal. We focus on the security of the network. We focus on the security of the systems. And the data that we're trying to protect as organizations, either we don't even really understand what it is that we have in terms of data and what's valuable or what's not. 
Uh, we don't know where it is stored. We don't know where it's processed and, and we don't know how we get it in. We don't know how it goes out. We as an industry tend to focus on the systems, the networks, and not necessarily the data. I mean, I had PCI customers. What's PCI? It's credit card security. Why am I here? Credit card security. I'd ask them, what's our goal here? They couldn't answer the question. I think they thought it was a trick question, but it really wasn't. In the DOD, and we don't need to go into the details, you know, there's lots of different variations of this, but there's a concept of different types of data have different value. And different types of data have a different life expectancy. And the, the, the best way I can give you an illustration is um, if you've seen a war movie, you know, especially like Korea, Vietnam, maybe some of the, the later movies, where you know, a, a ground force is deployed somewhere and they're being attacked by a machine gun nest or you know, the bad guy's out there somewhere. So they want to call in an airstrike and they're calling in coordinates. These days it'd probably be GPS and it's a lot more accurate, but imagine Vietnam, they're, they're giving grid coordinates, latitude, longitude. You can imagine that the accuracy of that information is very important and it's very important to make sure you're giving the coordinates of the people that you actually want to have the bombing or strafing run done and not the good guys. So that information is very sensitive, but that information is only sensitive for maybe a half an hour because once the bombing run's been done, whether it worked or not, it's kind of moot that the coordinates were sent out. You get that? Life expectancy. We don't have that concept, uh, I think, uh, for the most part in the commercial world, with the exception of maybe financial data, financial records have to be retained for X number of years. But even again, most companies that I've worked with over the years that have that retention requirement, they don't know that it's okay to get rid of it after seven years. Most companies just tend to, tend to hoard everything because they never know when they're going to need it. And don't even get me started on email retention. That's a whole different story. <laughs> so. There's this concept in the DOD of different data has different value. I don't see that a whole lot in the commercial world. So I throw that out as an idea of maybe that's something that we should consider. Maybe we need to look at our systems and networks and try to figure out what we're actually dealing with. Maybe we should try to understand what type of data, what type of information we have and assign some sort of value to it. Now, Yes, a lot of companies have data classification, but it's usually in most cases, and raise your hand if you've seen an exception, it's usually you know, public unclassified or company confidential. I mean, it's, it's usually binary. And again, it's like we have to protect it at all costs. We don't know why or for how long, but we just know we have to do it. Or yeah, it's okay to let out there. Um, the concept of security in depth. This is not a new concept. This is a, a, an aerial view of a city. I want to say it's in Italy, and, and this city was built in, in like medieval times. You can see that there's layers there. You can imagine that the, the, uh, the king or the ruler, or whoever was the head guy, you can, you can figure out where he was in the time of conflict. <laughs> And the whole idea is, and, this, and again, this is not a new concept. We talk about network segmentation. We talk about security in depth. But I don't see a lot of companies and organizations talking about it from the perspective of it's okay for things on the perimeter to kind of go by the wayside. In fact, I, get, I wrote a, a blog article a couple months ago talking about the whole concept of uh, you know, perimeter security, which is really what this is an illustration of. Especially, you know, in the early days, plugging into the Internet, Internet bad, corporate network good, you know, and you worked your way in. So you had this concept of demilitarized zones and you worked your way in with increasing trust. Well, that's kind of gone now because where the heck is the perimeter these days when we've got cloud, when we've got mobile devices, who knows? But the idea of segmentation I th still think is important to consider, especially if you've figured out what your data is and figured out some data is more or less important than other data. Maybe you want to put it in different places. But the other thing, too, is there was a concept, at least when I was at NSA, applying this principle of security in depth is your systems don't ultimately have to be secure forever. Your systems have to be secure enough that it's more costly in terms of time and resources to make it worthwhile for the bad guy to go through it to get to it. And that's a weird concept that I don't see a whole lot in the public sector. The idea that just, you know, we used to measure the, uh, the, the, veracity of a, of a system, its value by the, it used to be the gross national product, nowadays it's gross domestic product, whole nother talk to discuss about. But we would say, well, okay, we have a particular adversary, guess who it was in the mid 80s or early 90s, 
and what's their GNP, and how much of that GNP would they dedicate to going after this set of information. And we would calculate this is how secure we needed to be. We needed to make it, we needed to make it harder. You know, go through a bunch of hoops, go through a bunch of hoops. The hacker, the bad guy, he's going to get bored. It's not worth his, his time and effort. He's going to move on. Go back to the, uh, uh, the story that I told at the beginning. My, my first experience of security which was you know, being insecure and, and learning a valuable lesson. You'll remember I said you know, there was all these protections. But as I look back on it over the course of my career, uh, what I realize on reflection is what there was when I worked at this, this, this uh, naval facility, this naval research base way back in the day, was that there was a culture of security. Everybody understood their role, everybody understood the rules, everybody understood the importance of following the rules, and everybody understood how they all work together. So yes, there's a perimeter fence, and that perimeter fence had security guards that would drive around and, 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 and inspect it periodically, make sure nobody had cut holes in it. It might have had cameras on it, depending on which organization I worked with over the years. There might even be motion sensors or detectors built into it. Different uh, associated uh, countermeasures, and with all the countermeasures, different processes and different rules. Same thing with, the, with the, the front desk. One of the rules at NSA was, you know, there was always a security guard watching you go through the turnstiles. Uh, in the early days, we didn't have turnstiles, but we had a picture badge, and we had to show it, and, you know, face, same, face, same. That was the security guard's, you know, task. Um, we went through a period, I think it was during one of the conflicts, where they thought the guards had gotten lazy, so they just, they had to touch the badge. And some of the guards didn't like that, so they got these little magic wand things. So, you know, like, they ripped the antennas off their radio, and so like, I touched your badge. And it, led, uh, it was weird. But the point was, they followed a process, they followed a rule, even though they kind of took liberties a little bit. Um, you know, and the whole idea of having locks on the door, sometimes there was double locks. You know, the pit had super secret double layers, if you believe the, the book, which I will neither confirm nor deny. Um, but, you know, change, change the combination periodically. I remember one, uh, I won't say which office or when, but uh, they changed the combination. It happened to be the, the, the score of the Super Bowl that year because they're somebody's favorite team had won the Super Bowl. You yeah, know, whatever. Um, changed the, you know, good passwords, you know, unguessable and all that kind of stuff. Again, processes. There's things built into it. And even the security guards, one of the things that was very true, especially at NSA, was they would rotate the security guards on a regular basis. Not to give them a break, not to, to relieve boredom, because, but they didn't want the security guards to get, you know, get to know you on a personal level. They didn't want facial recognition. Oh, Jeff, come on in. You know, I've seen you come in every day for the last three years. I don't know that you were fired yesterday and walked out. They don't want that to happen, so they would rotate the guards to try to reinforce the fact that the guards needed to look at the badge, match the face, touch it during the time that they had to touch it, even though they could use the magic wand. Um, I have taught for many years, and I learned this in the DOD and tried to bring it out, that you know, security, when you, when you start to take a, a programmatic approach to it, it's really a life cycle. It's really a process. I like to talk about how security is something you do. It's not really a state that you achieve. And in doing, it requires all these processes, all this working together, all these things in flow. And in the early days, uh, we came up with five steps, probably because, and this was before when Word had all these things available or PowerPoint. <laughs> we had to actually make this one. So again, uh, you know, in the early days, it was, let's start by assessing the situation. We were selling pen tests and vulnerability assessments. You're plugging into the internet, but you have this existing network. Let's figure out what's wrong and fix it. And, and once we've figured out what's wrong, let's develop a strategy, let's write down the rules, implement it, so on and so forth. Well, we've advanced a whole lot. Now we've got still five steps, and they've been changed a little bit, but it's still figure out what's wrong, and so on and so forth. So. Um, is this better? Is this, is this a proper application? I'll, I'll leave that for you guys to decide. But notice that data is considered an asset class. To me, data is the asset, and everything else are ro rota uh, is rotating or revolving, evolving, revolving around the data. Uh, so maybe I don't agree with that one. You can. It's up to you. Um, again, security is a life cycle. It's something that you have to do. Um, and you have to start somewhere. In fact, I think most companies today 
are doing something already. I mean, they've been in business a while, they've been on the internet for a while, they've been doing the security thing for a while to some degree or another. So the whole idea of starting off and assessing maybe is a moot point. Um, but I, I still maintain that if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't know what your target is, what you're trying to protect and where it is and to what degree you need to protect it, maybe you're setting yourself up for failure. Or can we at least acknowledge that the whole idea of protect everything to the same level at all costs isn't really working. We can flip back to that slide for the, the hacks of the week. Um, the last statement there, I'm pretty sure I, I have to give credit. I, that, that's something I heard Marcus Raynham say probably 20 years ago when I went to one of his talks. Uh, in case you don't know who Marcus Raynham is, we were talking about that last night. Um, He's effectively considered the inventor of the firewall, the godfather of the firewall. He, he built the first uh, firewall, and he acknowledges that he built it wrong, um, but he's still famous for it. But he's, I, you know, talk that I went to 20 years ago, he's, and he was talking about building a firewall policy. How do you know what rules to set on a firewall if you don't have a policy, a set of guidelines, a set of goals? So security without policy is simply technology. So, um, throw out some sort of semi-random thoughts just to try to continue to pique your interest, hopefully, and, and spark a conversation. Um, I think the whole security industry is as much to blame for the things that we've talked about in terms of the challenges, especially the whole money thing. But uh, uh, in no particular order, uh, I think customers, and I've had this experience many times where I'm trying to explain the process and, 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 and the cycle, and they're like, yeah, 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 we don't need that. Just tell us what to buy and where to put it. And what do the blinky lights mean? And I don't want to think about security. I just want to know that I've got X in place, and I'm, I'm good. In the early days, I've got a firewall, so I'm good, right? Or I've got antivirus installed, right? So I'm good. You know, and the list goes on and on. Um, and to some degree, you know, vendors run the industry, and to some degree it's not their fault, but you know, the companies that do look to someone to guide them or advise them about what to do in terms of investing and, and, and building security, they naturally turn to the vendors because that's who's calling them 20 times a day or sending them emails and spamming them. And so they finally take the phone call and they hear what they need to hear about, this is what you need, and by the way, I'm selling it, and it all works out. Um, <laughs> I should add that bullet point, but that's a whole nother, maybe this is why I'm unemployed, I don't know. Um, I think there's too much focus on the technology. Hopefully you've gotten that feel. Um, to me, it all starts with the data. The data happens to resides on a lot of technology. And, it's, and the technology is important. The technology is not going away, because I don't think most people are going to go reverting back to a one-time pad and taking four hours to write out one page of text. They want their streaming video and constantly updating their pictures and Snapchats and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I mentioned it earlier, uh, you know, I, I think sometimes we're focusing too much on the vulnerabilities. It certain keep, certainly keeps a lot of us employed, and it's certainly important. I'm not saying it's not important to understand what the system's vulnerabilities are, but can we acknowledge that they're not going away, that we're never, we're never going to get to this point where we're done? Because as long as we're implementing technology, there's going to continue to be vulnerabilities. So maybe, just maybe, we need to focus somewhere else. And that's related, and, and I might not make a whole lot of friends with this, but I think a lot of that has to do with penetration testing. Because very often the penetration testing that goes on today is focused on finding vulnerabilities. Penetration te testing, when done correctly, and you can watch our episode 500 on Security Weekly, we had a panel discussion on this, should really be emulating the threat. It should really be a fire drill. It should be trying to act like the bad guys and see how well they do at breaking in or not, and see how well you do at detecting their activities. That's a pen test. That's what a pen test should be. Um, and I mentioned that earlier. Nobody seems to understand what the difference between risk and threat is. They think it's synonymous. So uh, the DOD gave us lots of really, really good guidelines on how to, uh, to secure computers and systems. Anybody familiar with this know what it is? You guys don't count. <laughs> it, it all, it's called the Rainbow Series. It all started with the top left corner, the, what was called the Orange Book, cleverly because it has an orange cover. And uh, I want to say that came out in 83, was it five? 85, 
And what, what was funny to me the first time I was handed the, the orange book was, and, and when I first started, there was maybe 10 books in the series, maybe only eight. But the, the second book in the series was probably twice as thick as the orange book, and its title was, uh, and I'm paraphrasing because I haven't seen it in 25 years, but it was basically how to understand and interpret the orange book. <laughs> and it sort of went downhill from there. So if you think that's over the top and overkill and useless and how does that apply to the real world, I give you this. I saw this on uh, LinkedIn a, uh, a couple months ago. And uh, you can, if you search for a CISO mind map, you can Google it and zoom in and read it. But for all the small print that you can't read, assume that that's a technology and the, and the grayish blackish boxes are sort of domains, if you will, or areas. You know, things like uh, business enablement, project delivery lifecycle, budget, security architecture, compliance and audit, and so on and so forth. This is all the stuff that CISOs have to know. It, it's no wonder that companies continue to get broken because I don't know all this stuff. Nobody knows all this stuff. Um, this is another example. Again, I saw this out on, I think, LinkedIn or Twitter. Somebody, somebody tried to write down what all the different domains are within that word up there that I won't say. Um, <laughs> You know, again, the colors mean different sort of major domain areas and subplots. And, and again, if you, if you find this and read it in the small print, assume that for each one of these things there's a technology behind it or a technology solution or tool. Um, and people. I'm sorry? Yes. So, uh, if you've been around for a little while, you might have heard some variation of, you know, this whole information security revolves around people, processes, and technology. And of course, technology rules. And if you're a consultant, which I am and was, you know, we tend to focus on the people and processes. And people and processes are boring and it's not fun and you don't see a lot of blinky lights, so people like to skip to the technology. I submit to you, though, that there's a missing element. And that's you don't do any of this stuff without understanding what the purpose is, what the goal, what are you trying to accomplish with your security program. It's not enough to just do it just because everybody's doing it and because you're connected to the internet and you have systems and networks. And if you, you can get spun around the axle pretty quickly and we see it all the time because all of this stuff is done without a goal in mind. And, and how do you know if you're doing it well if you don't know what you're you know, trying to achieve? Uh, it's all about the information. Uh, these are just some of the, my summary thoughts, and I did not say that word once in this presentation. Ha! <laughs> Very briefly, uh, actually, let me go back. Uh, knowledge and awareness is key. After 34 years in the business, I think that probably the most important thing is we as a community, we as an industry, our, our customers, our companies that we work for, I think the, the biggest thing that we've lost from a DOD perspective is this idea of the culture of security. Everybody knows what they should and shouldn't do, and everybody knows what their responsibilities are, and everybody understands bad behaviors, and, what, and, and it's reinforced that they shouldn't do bad behaviors just because they need to do it to make the deadline or because the boss says so. Um, and, you know, and security people are the worst because they, they know how to bend the rules and break the rules and, and bypass the rules, and they're, they're oftentimes the worst offenders. If you don't believe me, go out and talk to some of them and find out some of the shortcuts they take. So knowledge is key. Um, quick word about my sponsor, which is Cybrary. Cybrary.it, they're an online open source training company. They've got thousands of topics. They've got tens of thousands of hours of video, and it's free. You register for free, sign up for free, and you can take all the training you want. If you want to get certified in CPA, CPE credit, they've got different labs and different deeper levels of courses. Yes, you have to start paying for them, but it's really affordable. Um, and if you're a company that has, or you work for a company that has technology that has training associated, or even with demos of what your product does, they would love to get that up there too. They're trying to be a resource, uh, you know, a one-stop shop, if you will, for everything related to IT and security. So check them out, cybrary.it. It's free to register. And uh, I'm actually in the, finishing up a course uh, that will be up there probably in the next week or two. So look for me as one of their contributors. The, uh, the Art of the Jedi Mind Trick, Learning Effective Communication Skills. <laughs> um, 
they're expecting to have a million subscribers probably by the end of the month. They, they get like 15,000 a week. And, the, and, and again, it's one of these slides that you can't keep updated. But they've got lots of really cool... You know, I can't say that it's all great information because they're sucking in everything and they don't necessarily curate it all. But they've got a pretty functional search feature and you can... You, there's just a lot of material out there. I, I encourage you to at least check it out. So any questions or comments, we've got a five or ten minutes left. I'm available. Push back. Disagree. Agree. Anything. Yes? So, um, between, you know, uh, controlled unclassified information, D cards, NIST 853, 171, all that kind of stuff. You're talking gibberish. What is all that stuff? <laughs> I'm sure most of us are inundated with this, you know, the, the, the contractor, you know, mm -hmm. Well, two things. One, I should have been passing a microphone out for you to ask the question, or the, somebody should do it. And once you get the mic in your hand, my question back to you is, uh, clarify what you mean by the storm, just so I make sure I understand that. So I'd say probably over the past year or so, I, I, you know, maybe about 18 months ago, I got like you know, one questionnaire, you mm -hmm. know, and then in the past year, I've had probably five or six questionnaires from different contractors, you know, that we work with as a subcontractor, and every right. one of them, you know, it's anywhere from one to ten pages, and they might use Google's open source contraption to design it, or they use somebody's, you know, right. and it's question after question after question after question, you know, and a lot of stuff where, frankly, you probably want an NDA, you know, just to, to give them that information, you know. Mm -hmm. um, are these the kind of things, do you see this trend, in, with your experience in the industry increasing, that we're going to expect to see more and more of these things, you know, is there... You know, I, I mean, you know, ISO certificate 27001 maybe might be able to help you with this kind of stuff. But I mean, do you see, is this a storm maybe that we're just going to have to weather and maybe this will just die off, you know, and the industry will get tired of it? Or? Well, my opinion, and, uh, and others can weigh in, but I, I think in the industry over the years, it's sort of a pendulum swing. And while there's these, this occasional recognition, we need to do more, the people processes things, um, often it boils down to endless checklists. And uh, you know what's missing is that, over, in my opinion, the, the overarching, overarching understanding of security, the goals and objectives. Which of those questions apply and don't? Is it okay to say NA, and that's an acceptable answer? Um, most com I'm most familiar with PCI, but most compliance standards, as I've read through them, are fairly good in terms of if you're running this, do this. And, and you know, rinse, lather, lather, rinse, and repeat that a thousand times over. What they don't do is say, um, you're this type of company doing this type of business with this type of data, so this subset applies to you. They sort of expect you to figure all that out. Here's everything in the kitchen sink. I mean, think the rainbow series. Every possible permutation you could think of for technology, it's out there and how to secure it. Um, you know, more recently that would be probably the NIST cybersecurity framework. You mentioned some of the other things. HIPAA, uh, I, I was asked to, to do a, a talk on HIPAA a year or two ago, so I like sat down to learn HIPAA and it's like, okay, you need to protect private health data. And I'm like, okay, what is that? I have yet to find the definition. <laughs> it, I, I'm totally serious. There is not a definition of PHI within the HIPAA standard. There's examples. There's a, a broad sort of framework if, you know, it's any information that's health, healthcare related that ties back to an individual. Well, that's sort of a definition, but it's sort of left up to, you know, the user, the, the consumer that has to, to, to follow HIPAA to figure that out and then apply what needs to apply. So there's a disconnect and I think the pendulum swing is, okay, we do a lot of technology, okay, we know we need to do some process. What, but we don't know how to do that, so let's just throw out some questionnaires. And we don't know what applies or do doesn't apply, so fill out everything, because I don't know, that's what they told us to do. Um, and I saw, you mentioned DFARS, so I actually do acquisitions for the DOD, and theoretically with FedRAMP, it's supposed to be do once and use many. Okay. So that's the whole idea. So theoretically, it should slow down, but as Jeff said, it needs to be a continuous <laughs> process. 
And I think that's going to be the cultural shift that will need to change. I think ironically, what I have hopefully described a little bit in a way that's understandable, understandable is DOD level security largely doesn't exist in the DOD today. <laughs> they, they lost the institutional knowledge. They lost the culture. And, 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 and most recently, the DOD has tried to sort of adapt the way the, the real world does it back into the DOD, which I think is ironic and, and interesting and disturbing all at the same time. Did you have a question before? I think we're looking for the perfect state of security and everybody wants to point to a standard to say if that's perfect mm -hmm. we're going to measure ourselves against perfection but if we start shifting our mindset around the fact that security is never a destination mm -hmm. it's a journey right mm -hmm. then how can we have these perfect standards so sending out all these surveys is great but it's always just a moment in time mm -hmm. and as long as organizations walk into it with that then I think it won't feel so overwhelming. Yep. Yeah, we used to talk about, uh, in, for a PCI practice that, we, that I was part of, we used to talk to our customers about treating security as a program and not a project. It, you know, it's an ongoing thing. Question there and then in the back. So, I mean, I, I kind of feel like you set yourself up for finding a lot of companies that are very focused on compliance by, by doing the PCI thing. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, when, when, you, when you go and you look at a new company, uh, or new to you, um, other than just sitting down and, and taking a, a good long time to really understand their culture and get a feel for particular individuals, what, what are the key marks that you, you notice that say to you, this company actually does have a culture of security? You're assuming that I've found one that has that. <laughs> um, I, yeah. I did consulting for many years before I was sent to PCI Purgatory, and I used to talk back then about the companies that we would approach that uh, hired, us, hired us to do a pen test or a vulnerability assessment. The ones that said, well, we just, you know, I'm going to date myself. And so we had one company that said, we just, we just installed the gauntlet, and we went to training. So we're good. We want you to pen test us. And I was just doing some, you know, port scanning remotely, and I'm like, I don't even see a firewall. I'm seeing everything. Long story short, ended up, guess what the last rule was on their firewall? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've had many companies that say, oh, we don't store that data. We don't capture that kind of data. I had a PCI customer that had a web screen, you know, e-commerce site where they asked for the CVV. I'm like, well, what do you do with that? Well, we just throw it away. I'm like, yeah, that's going to come back to bite them. And guess what I found when I was looking at their database? It was encrypted, but that doesn't matter. You're not allowed to keep the CVV. Um, so the flip side to that is the companies that perhaps had the right attitude were the ones, and I'd, you know, we could say it was a culture, they were the ones that would come to us and say, well, we're trying to do the best things. We're, we, we think we're doing OK. We, we think we've covered our bases, but we're not sure, and we, and we want you to test us. Those companies, we often had a very hard time breaking into, and, and, but they had, a they had an attitude of humility, which I guess is corporate culture, that, okay, we think we're doing okay, but we don't know what we don't know. Find us out. They tended to be more secure. We had a hard harder time breaking into them and finding all the vulnerabilities in the holes. Um, did you work your way to the back? Yes. The PCI is uh, slightly different than the DOD um, model, where the DOD has actually started to evolve. Uh, what's old is new again. They're, you know, disc cap to die cap to RMF. You know, again, they, they've gone back. <laughs> I have no idea what these acronyms to, are. Yeah, they've gone back to where risk WTF. is associated, and you, you never defined risk tolerance because you, you kind of defined risk, and then you kind of talked around what the risk means. I didn't define risk. I just said it's an equation, and sure. I talked about the elements. Risk but tolerance. What, what, what does risk mean to somebody? Well, risk is how much risk are you willing to endure in order to get your job done or uh, complete your mission? Right. So I was just wondering, you know, PCI is very firm. It's you must protect, you know, the credit card information, um, privacy information, et cetera, right. same as HIPAA. Uh, but will you, do, will you draw the same uh, risk analysis for, say, a laptop that goes out to uh, do um, recruiting as you would for a laptop that does uh, encryption or uh, pen testing? 
Well, so I didn't mention risk tolerance, and, and, it's, and I probably should. Thank you for bringing that up. The idea of risk tolerance is, is different for everybody. I mean, you know, you got out of bed this morning and walked out of your dom domicile and, you know, got into a car, bike, walking, whatever. That's a risk. It's a risk to roll out of bed, but most of us take a lot of risks. I get on an airplane frequently. That's risky. Um, I'm married with children. That's risky. Um, <laughs> You know, the idea of risk tolerance, you know, in our sense, it, risk tolerance usually boils down to, again, it's a money thing. How much are you risking, willing to risk losing? How much are you willing to risk being fined? Uh, you know, I've had PCI customers that weren't compliant, and they acknowledged that, and they paid the fine while they were on a path to compliance. But that became a part of doing, I had one customer, several customers that like, eh, we'll just pay the fine. That's a, that's a perfectly valid risk tolerance decision, but it's not my decision necessarily. Yes, sir. The, um, so PCI is different, and everybody brace yourself. I'm going to say something vaguely supportive of PCI. Um, the challenge with uh, risk tolerance in PCI in particular and other uh, compliance issues is externalities. Um, you have to follow PCI because if I'm an irresponsible merchant, it can cost you money. If my credit card data gets popped and then somebody comes to your store, spends money, you're the one as the merchant that gets taken. So we have a, we have a financial externality that actually justifies something like PCI. I won't say it justifies PCI. <laughs> so if you're willing to accept the risk, um, that doesn't mean that you should be able to endanger the entire uh, financial system because you're irresponsible yeah. and that's where things like pci come into play and if we don't actually do a good job then heaven forbid people in washington make it laws and make it even worse for all of us yeah i mean it's kind of along the lines of why is it a law that you have to wear a seatbelt, right i mean you know why do we have insurance or why do we have what, what is it called Un uninsured insurance whatever that thing is what's it Uninsured driver insurance, because everybody has insurance, right? So, yeah, I agree. Um, I'm only keeping you from lunch, so feel free to hang out and ask more <laughs> questions, or the bar, or the tavern, or, or I don't know, or let's run out to Harvard Yard real quick and take pictures. <laughs>